first speaker today, uh, two exciting uh, speakers. I've gotten to know them a little bit better uh, as we came up here yesterday. First is Dr. Jacqueline Schinker, and she's an associate professor in the at the University of Wyoming in the Department of Geography. She received her Bachelor of Science degree in Geosciences from the University of Arizona and got both her master's and her PhD degrees in geography from the University of Oregon. We call her JJ, if that's okay, publicly, yes. Um, and JJ has served as an assistant professor at the, uh, in the Department of Geography and Geology and Anthropology at Indiana State University, and she came to the University of Wyoming in 2005. She teaches classes in physical geography, weather and climate, natural hazards in society, global climate variability, and geographic and scientific visualization. I can tell you that Dr. Schinker was re recognized last year as one of the top 10 professors in the College of Arts and Sciences at the university, and when you hear her today, you'll know why. Dr. Schenker is the author of numerous uh, journal and articles and a book chapter, and we're pleased to have her with us today to talk about climate, drought, and water in the West. JJ? Thank you for that introduction, Maggie. Can you all hear me in the back? Great. I teach a large lecture class for the sciences, so I have a tendency to project. <laughs> I'm very excited to be here. I was so thrilled to get Maggie's email um, to, to invite me here. I have really wanted to do Saturday U for quite a while, and so it was a great pleasure to fly up here, and it's very exciting to be here, so thank you for taking your time to come here as well. Um, as you can see on this title slide, we've got a few images. One I'll point up here in the upper left-hand side. The Geography Department of the University of Wyoming has probably one of the best logos on campus. Um, <laughs> and I'll let you know that the third week in November is Geography Awareness Week, and our students in the Geography Club will be selling hats embroidered with our fantastic logo, and we call this one Continental Joe. So if you're looking for some geography swag, you just let me know and we'll set you up. Um, I'm going to be talking about climate drought and water in the West. Um, and you can see here in the center, we're going to touch on some concepts here because water is very relevant to energy production and energy extraction. Um, water is important in terms of municipalities and, and recreation and endangered species. Um, but in the center here, I have people. Um, because in, in a lot of aspects, we often put ourselves in the center of things, and, and we make decisions um, about how we manage water based on our needs. So I'll touch on a few of these topics. Where I'm going to start today is give you a sense of the interesting chemistry and physics experiment that has consequences in terms of global warming, and we'll take a look at global temperature pattern trends and some of the causes of the changes that we have seen and that we're committed to in the future, and also take it closer to home and look at some of the regional impacts related to increases in, temp increases in temperature and what that means in terms of one of our most valuable resources, both in the state and on the planet, and that happens to be freshwater resources. Um, and how I'm going to talk about this is in the context of snowmelt and stream flow and l changes in lake levels and, and ultimately drought. So we've had an interesting century plus of time recently in terms of temperatures. This is looking at June through August global surface temperatures. Um, these are anomalies, so the zero line represents the long-term mean. Anything below that is colder than normal. Anything above that is warmer than normal. We're projected um, from 1880 to present. Um, we're looking at this year here, 2015. We are already looking at the warmest year in history um, over this time period from the 1880s. In fact, if we take a look at each of the months down here on the bottom from January through December, this thick black line is 2015. The other colored lines represent the six warmest years. Um, 2014 was our previous warmest year, and you can see them listed over here on the right-hand side. Um, we're pretty much committed to being the warmest year on record. There's really not much that will happen on our planet to cause us to not be the warmest year on record. Um, and you all will be enjoying a beautiful day of 75 degree temperature um, here in Jackson today. 
In terms of those temperatures, this is really tied to the chemistry and physics in terms of our atmosphere, of how things are operating. Here we're looking at a graphic of changes in carbon dioxide concentration. That's what we're showing here in CO2. Uh, the time frame on the x-axis is 1960 to present. What we're looking at here is how atmospheric carbon dioxide changes year to year, and that rise and fall is related to the seasonal inhale and exhale of vegetation in terms of that photosynthetic process of plants drawing in carbon dioxide, and then when some of those plants change their colors on their leaves and drop their leaves, then CO2 is then released to the atmosphere, which is a natural seasonal process in terms of photosynthesis. Superimposed on that is this ever-increasing trend. And this is one of the components that we're looking at in terms of changes in temperature, is this ever-increasing trend. One thing that's important is thinking about our pre-industrial levels before the Industrial Revolution were roughly at 280 parts per million, and you can see that we're well above that right now. Our most recent measurements from August of 2015 are at 398.2 parts per million. And over the last one million years, CO2 has never really varied much between 180 and 280 parts per million. So we're well outside that range of variability. What this means is we take into consideration a few things. We take into consideration changes in carbon emissions, which this is the first curve up top here. We see changes in carbon emissions are related to land use change. And then we also see changes in carbon um, emissions in the atmosphere as a result of fossil fuels. We take material that is in its solid or liquid form in some reservoir, and then we combust it, and it is liberated into the atmosphere. The CO2 concentrations have increased very rapidly ever since the Industrial Revolution, and the consequence of those increases in CO2 have, have, are related to the increases in temperature. Now, how this works is a result of a variety of relationships in terms of our atmosphere. So what we're looking at here, if we take this figure, everything on the left side of this figure has to do with energy coming in from the sun and reaching the surface of the Earth. Sometimes that energy is uh, reflected back by really bright clouds. Some of that energy is reflected back by really bright surfaces. But a good portion of that incoming solar radiation is absorbed by the surface of our planet then our planet does the, all of this stuff on the right-hand side, and it releases energy, but in the form of long-wave radiation. So the energy from the sun is in short wavelengths because the sun is really hot. The energy from the Earth is in long wavelengths because it's cooler than the sun. Now I'm going to give you a little bit of a physics and chemistry experiment in about 90 seconds or less. So the reason this is valuable information in terms of understanding concentrations of a variety of different gases has to do with how those gases interact with both shortwave radiation underneath this red curve on the top and longwave radiation in terms of energy emitted from the Earth over here under this blue curve. Wavelengths are down here on this x-axis. They get larger as you go from left to right. Most of the gases in our atmosphere, water vapor, carbon dioxide, um, methane down here, nitrous oxide, among others, are almost completely invisible to that shortwave radiation that comes in from the sun. So that energy from the sun makes it through the gases in our atmosphere. You can see over here, oxygen and ozone, this shaded area in the shortest wavelengths is actually stratospheric ozone that absorbs UV radiation. Good news for soft tissue creatures at the surface, that UV radiation get absorbed, then we don't have to absorb it, and then we don't have as much skin cancer and things like that. But that's occurring in the stratosphere. Most everything else is occurring in the troposphere where our weather occurs. And these gases are very effective at absorbing long-wave radiation. In other words, they're invisible to short-wave radiation, but they're opaque to outgoing long-wave radiation from the Earth. So those gases absorb outgoing long-wave radiation, and then they re-radiate it back to the surface into the atmosphere. And that's how we see increasing temperatures. What's interesting about this is if we take into consideration a variety of gases, which is on this left column here, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and things like that, those gases have a net positive radiative forcing because they absorb long wave radiation. And down here is our total anthropogenic radiative forcing. That's the amount of radiative forcing as a result of anthropogenic processes that contribute these gases to the atmosphere. 
What's notable about this bottom portion of this diagram is the first image or the first bar on the bottom portion is our contribution of anthropogenic forcing from 1950. The second one up from the bottom is to 1980. And then we have 2011. Each of these bars gets progressively larger because our populations are getting larger and we're burning more fossil fuels, among other things, that contribute these greenhouse gases to our atmosphere. So our net radiative forcing is all on the positive side of the spectrum rather than on the negative side of the spectrum, which is why our planet is warming up. What's interesting about this, as Maggie mentioned, my undergraduate degree was in geology. And I have a tendency to think about things on a variety of different time scales. And as it turns out, scales matter. Here we're looking at the last um, roughly 500,000 years on this x-axis here. And this is information from the European project of ice coring in Antarctica, or IPECA. What they do is they go to Antarctica and they drill cores from ice, the top being roughly present, and we go back in time as we go down. Those cores get sent off to a variety of labs around the world, and armies of graduate students slice up those cores. They extract little air bubbles from those ice cores, and we can identify the concentration of various gases back in time. This blue set of curves is showing the concentration of carbon dioxide over the last roughly 700,000 years. And we can see that the variations in carbon dioxide have ranged from 180 down here to about 280 up here. But we are roughly presently at about 398, and I took this scale and extended it upwards, and this dotted line represents where we are presently. Each one of these tick marks on this horizontal axis is 10,000 years. So in terms of scale, the rate of change of the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere is far, not only far outside the range of natural variability, but the rate of that increase is also outside of that range of natural variability. So this leads us to looking at a different time scale. Here we're looking at closer to more human time scales. In terms of climatic variations, the bottom curve represents the last 1,000 years of temperatures, okay? The red portion of that curve is really this information up top here. That's data from thermometers, okay? But if we go back in time, this blue curve represents data, temperature data that is derived from proxy data. Um, things like tree rings, some trees grow annual growth rings, really thick rings mean good growing conditions, really narrow rings mean very poor conditions. So we can take um, things like tree ring data, we can measure coral growth rates, we can also go back in time and look at written records, especially from vineyards. Written records from vineyards and from ship records give us very exact information about temperature because people are concerned about grape harvests and things like that that are very much tied to specific temperatures. So we can reconstruct those temperatures as we go back in time. This black line is our long-term mean. So we can see that temperatures have been cooler on average over the last thousand years until about the Industrial Revolution and we see that really rapid increase of temperatures overall. And we see that globally. We also see it in terms of the northern hemisphere as well. This is taking that information into consideration and looking at it from that Industrial Revolution to present. So we're really getting a sense, if you will, of a variety of time scales and what is a good time scale to uh, depict the information that we're interested in looking at. So over this time scale, temperatures have overall increased. That's this red curve. But what's really interesting about this, remember our radiative forcings have, ever, have been ever increasing through time. And the slopes of these lines, as we move closer to present, is getting steeper and steeper. So in other words, another way to look at this is temperatures are increasing, but they're increasing faster and faster as we move closer to present. That's actually an important component in trying to understand what are the forcing mechanisms or what's causing that warming is a big portion of what we're trying to understand so that then we can apply that information to understanding the impacts in terms of water resources. Here we're looking at a couple of different ways of looking at this information. One way that we try to understand climate variability and climate change is to model past climate. If we can capture cl past climate events, then those models are working pretty well from a physics perspective, and then we can use those models to project what may be happening in the future. 
So down here on the bottom, we're looking at the 1900s to roughly present, and we're only taking into consideration natural forcings. And natural forcings in terms of climate have to do with the sun, that is the strength of the sun. Sometimes the sun is very active, sometimes the sun is not very active, and that has about 11 to 22 year cycle associated with that component. The second natural forcing has to do with volcanoes. Big volcanic eruptions in the tropics have a tendency to lead to overall decline in global temperatures for about three to five years or so, and that impacts crop productivity and things like that. So with only natural forcings, which happen to be the blue line, the projection is, is that temperatures would be essentially going down. We're supposed to be heading towards an ice age, but we're not. In fact, temperatures are going up. That's this black line. That's where the actual thermometer data is showing us that temperatures are going up. So how do we describe this upward trend if it's not just natural forcings? And the only way that we can capture that upward trend with this red line here is if we consider natural forcings of sun and, sun and volcanic activity, but also in terms of thinking about greenhouse gases, like carbon dioxide and methane and things like that, and also sulfate aerosols, which actually, which actually have a slight negative net decline in temperature. But when we consider human activity and natural forcings, then we're able to capture those increases in temperature. Another part of the story is to think about what actually is contributing to that warming. And here we're looking at what we refer to as the day-night temperature range, or the diurnal temperature range is another way of thinking about it. We're looking at data from 1950 to roughly present. We're looking at maximum temperature here, minimum temperature in the middle, and the diurnal temperature range down on the bottom. The key here is that if warming is a function of greenhouse gases, which it is, um, as opposed to the sun, nighttime temperatures should increase faster than daytime temperatures. So in other words, you know, the sun's not out at night. So how can we explain an increase in nighttime temperatures? And that's what we're seeing, an increase in minimum temperatures, right? In the valley today, it, in some places, it got to freezing, but the National Weather Service says our lowest temperature here in Jackson was about 34 degrees. So we didn't get to freezing today. And that's a pretty warm temperature for this time of year in terms of minimum temperature. And in fact, this year, the state of Wyoming has reached a record-breaking year in terms of minimum temperature. We have our warmest minimum temperatures this year in 2015 compared to any other year in the last 118 years. So that minimum temperature compared to our maximum temperature is decreasing. In other words, it's getting warmer at night. And the only way that it can get warmer at night is a function of those greenhouse gases. But maybe it's the sun. You know, if we're not convinced yet, let's think about the sun's activity. And down here is solar output over the last several decades. You can see sometimes the sun is very active, sometimes it's not very active, and it goes through this very cyclic nature. If we were to put an average line through this set of curves here on the bottom, it would really be a flat line. But yet our overall global temperatures are increasing quite rapidly. OK, so it's not the sun. What about urbanization? You know, one thought here is that we have an increase in cities, we have increases in population, so perhaps the warming that we're seeing is a function of um, increased urbanization. So okay, we can actually look at that information. On this graphic here from the 1930s to present, the red represents all data from urbanized, uh, from urbaniz urbanized environment um, uh, and also non-urbanized environment. The green represents all stations minus stations near cities. And the purple represents the difference. In other words, there's really not much difference as a function of urbanization. So our overall increases in global temperatures, not due to the sun, not due to urbanization, but it has a big relationship to those increases in heat trapping gases. So if we look at this time period, 1882, roughly present, anything down here below the zero line are things that contribute to an overall cooling of the planet like volcanic eruptions, aerosols from volcanoes, aerosols from industrial activities, um, land use change and things like that, and then we've got the sun's energy output. But really, what's causing these increases in temperature are these heat trapping gases, the gases that absorb long wave radiation from the sun. So now that we've dispensed with some of the causes, now we need to deal with what's actually happening. And here we're looking at temperatures over the last thousand years. Not much change until we see the Industrial Revolution, then we have a very rapid increase. 
Over here on the far right-hand side, these various colored curves represent the ranges of temperature increases forecasted for the future. Okay? We end over here at about 2100. We can see that each of these cases, we're looking at an increase in temperature. Each of these cases represent a variety of scenarios where we embrace some sort of uh, global perspective of uh, renewable resources or changes of our energy sources or things like that. And they have a variety of economic components to them. All of these are indicative of an upward trend. In other words, we've seen warming and we're committed to more warming in the future. Big question is, what does that mean for us? Okay, so it's going to be warmer. But what we really care about in the West happens to be water, as it turns out. It is our most valuable resource. Here I've listed um, our states, uh, statewide averages for annual precipitation in the arid Western United States. Okay, these are our top seven states and the amount of precipitation. The national average, 36.6 inches. But this is where the West is. So we are inherently a dry portion of the country. Wyoming is uh, ranked third in terms of driest states after Nevada and Utah. So here we're looking at a variety of headwaters that exist. And this is one of the things to me that is captivating about the state of Wyoming. We have beautiful mountains, and those beautiful mountains are our natural reservoirs, if you will, in terms of water resources. The snow that falls in those mountain ranges provide us with water and provide a lot of the rest of the country with water as well. We happen to have the headwaters for three of the major drainage basins in the United States. We have the headwaters to the Platte and the Missouri River. We have headwaters to the Snake in Columbia. And then we have headwaters to the Green and the Colorado River. Some of these headwaters happen to be not far from here in the Wind River Range. Um, and I'm showing this image down here in the lower left of Lake of the Woods in the Wind River Range. Um, and you can actually even see some beetle kill in the background, some of these red trees. Um, this is a lake that we did some studies on to look at how the lake levels varied through time. Because that's one way that we're trying to get at understanding how water resources have varied through time in the state. Here's a look at the Wyoming average annual precipitation. Or actually, I like to think of this map as, as almost a map showing topography in the state of Wyoming. Right? You get all of your major mountain ranges that show up over here by Laramie. You know, you've got the winds. You've got the Yellowstone Plateau and the Bighorns over here. Beautiful example of the role of topography in terms of precipitation in our arid state. And this is actually pretty important when we think about the area in terms of our state and how much precipitation falls around the state. Uh, these orange areas, these sort of browny orange areas, are the areas that receive less than 16 inches of annual precipitation. Okay? So 71% of our state receives less than 16 inches of precipitation. This is the area within the state um, that has a majority of the land that is above 10,000 feet, very snow dominated often has snow sometimes year-round, or at least used to, and some of these mountains are really our natural reservoirs in terms of water resources. 7% of the land in the state of Wyoming actually accounts for our heavy snow-dominated precipitation over 32 inches annually in those locations. So we have a state with varied topography and a variety of water resources available um, that are very localized in these high-elevation mountainous environments. And that's where we get into the story about water resources. This image is showing the consequence of the trend in timing of stream melt, snow melt runoff. Okay, we're looking from 1948 to the early 2000s. Uh, larger red circles mean earlier snow melt or earlier onset of snow melt. So here's where it gets a little tricky. In order for precipitation to occur, you need two ingredients. You need moisture availability and some sort of uplift mechanism in the atmosphere. So temperature technically doesn't really cause precipitation. There's some other physics in the atmosphere that leads to precipitation. But we can talk about water resources by taking into consideration temperature because temperature is a big player in terms of spring snowmelt runoff. Temperatures are very important in terms of late season flow. And temperatures are really important in terms of evaporation. So temperature plays a role in terms of water resources, and that's what I'm trying to get at in some of the research that we're doing at UW. So this curve here in the middle is looking at Wyoming springtime temperatures. Okay, you can see an ever-increasing trend in that. This is a closer look at that. So one thing to note on this graphic, we're looking at 1950 to the early 2000s. 
there's a huge amount of variability. That's this, you know, up and down line here, right? And we can appreciate sometimes it can be really, really warm. Sometimes it can be really, really cold. Because we live in a mountainous environment, we have a high degree of climatic variability. That's inherent to our environment. But if we average these conditions for springtime, the increase is up, or the change is an upward increase. And that's the important component of water resources. Also, we need to think about Wyoming's springtime temperatures. That's when our snow melts. And here we're looking at March, April, May. That's what MAM stands for. Minimum temperatures, remember, minimum temperatures are increasing very rapidly. And again, this is almost like a map of topography. We've got our winds, we've got the Yellowstone Plateau, and the Bighorns here in our mountains down in southeast Wyoming, where all of those locations are ex seeing extreme increases in minimum annual springtime temperatures. I'll note this blue dot down here happens to be located near the Red Desert, um, and there aren't a lot of climate stations in that area. So this data is a little questionable down here. So here's a map. This very light map is actually the western U.S. Here's Wyoming up here. Down here are the southwestern portion of the western United States. I like to call this the supply and demand image, okay? Um, here we have our supply. The Green River is the largest tributary to the Colorado River system, okay? And the Colorado River system is broken up. Upper basin states up here with our beautiful mountains and the snowpack, lower basin states down here, Arizona, part of southern New Mexico, California, and part of Nevada. We provide some of the greatest supply to this river system courtesy of our beautiful mountains. One of the most beautiful places on the planet, I think, Green River Lakes. It's really amazing. This is where some of that water goes, Las Vegas, Nevada. It's a very interesting juxtaposition, both uh, you know, vertically um, and also in terms of water. What's interesting about the Western US is we have seen a boom in our population, especially in the Southwest. It is, according to the US Census, the fastest growing population in the country. In the last 10 to 15 years, the population has increased by about five to seven million people in the Southwest, and they're thirsty, right? So here we're looking at an ensemble of temperatures, both past temperatures, the increases that we've seen recently, and then future temperature projections, okay? Now if we look at each of these various ensembles, um, this is from the National Academy of Sciences, we can see that there's a general agreement that temperatures are gonna continue to increase. Okay, got it. It's warm, it's gonna get warmer. Here's the tricky part. What's gonna happen with precipitation? Remember, temperature doesn't necessarily cause precipitation to occur. So here's how those variety of models are dealing with or thinking about projecting precipitation. Here are your options. It's either gonna be wetter, it's going to be the same, or it's going to be drier. Those are our three options for the future, okay? So, you know, how do you think that that you know, sort of portray is portrayed in terms of thinking about our gro ever-growing population in the West and in the Southwest. You know, we'd better hope that we're up here. But in terms of our water resources, we need to take into consideration what's happening in the mountains as well. And, and this is what I like to call the whiskey is for drinking, water is for fighting over diagram. We're looking at a couple of things here. Time, 2000 at the origin on the far left-hand side, and we're looking into the future, 2050 on the far right-hand side. The gray curve represents our supply, and that is the supply of water from the upper basin states in the Colorado River Basin. The red represents the estimated population increase within the Colorado River Basin. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, so this is really what we're looking at in the next 20 to 30 years is a very distinct um, challenge that we face in terms of our water resources in comparison to our demand in terms of our population. And I have down here this note that it is important to include a range of drought conditions from the past, from the geologic record and from our written records, to be able to understand the broad range of contingencies for future water planning. And that's where some of my research and the research that I do with others at UW comes into play. Um, we go off to beautiful lakes in the mountains in Wyoming. Um, we core sediments from these lakes. This is from Lake of the Woods. Um, and this is myself and uh, Professor Brian Schumann from the geology department. We're coring the sediment 
right? Just like the ice cores, the top is present, and we go back in time. Um, and we look at how vegetation has changed through time, and vegetation is very closely tied to temperature, so we can reconstruct past temperatures looking at vegetation change. Um, Brian also has this awesome piece of equipment, a ground-penetrating radar. This is a $60,000 piece of equipment that he has strapped to a $10 uh, Walmart inner tube <laughs> that he's dragging across a lake. I always give him a hard time about that. And this, this piece of equipment provides information about lake levels of the past, where the shorelines used to exist, so we can track when there were droughts and when the lakes were lower, and when there were weren't droughts and when there was plenty of water in the lakes. And we've been able to reconstruct past environments. Now I'm gonna switch to the uh, southeast portion of the state over near where UW is located, which is part of the Upper Platte River Basin. This water here is 100% allocated between Colorado, Wyoming, and Nebraska. All of it's accounted for, okay? And the water that comes, comes from mountains, not necessarily as spectacular as the Tetons, but still natural reservoir of snowpack. And what we're gonna look at is what has happened to temperatures in this region. Here we're looking at temperatures, and uh, um, annual temperatures are in gray, from the early 19 teens to roughly close to present. The black line represents the increases in springtime temperature. And here's the interesting part, is what we found our changes in temperature in the Upper Platte River Basin in this division, in this climate division, are increasing annually and every month and every season of the year over this time period. But what's most important is that temperatures during those spring months, March, April, and May, when the snow is melting, are increasing the fastest. In fact, springtime temperatures are increasing at a rate that is one and a half times the rate of the annual increase. So springtime temperatures are warming up faster than they are during any other time of the year. Coupled with that, we looked at precipitation, wintertime precipitation, in the same area. Um, here annual is in gray again, and the black represents December, January, February. Both we see a decline in terms of precipitation, uh, but there's a greater precipitation that's occurring, or a greater decline that's occurring in December, January, and February, or winter months. I will note, there is a high degree of variability. We have really wet years, lots of snow, really dry years. But overall, the average of these conditions is a downward trend. So couple increases in springtime temperatures with a decline in wintertime snowpack, and that could lead to a strain in terms of your water resources. And what we did is we looked at the runoff from the North Gate uh, River Gauge Station. This station happens to be above any impoundments, so it gives a representation of natural stream flow for this particular headwater region. And we see that there's a decline in the peak runoff. Not only that, but we see the flow is declining as well. And what's interesting about this is we've been able to quantify for every increase in temperature, every one degree C increase in temperature for this particular watershed, the onset of spring is occurring almost five days earlier. So in other words, we've seen about two and a half, eight, two and a half degrees C increase in temperature, and this region is seeing an onset of spring runoff by about 10 and a half days. So in other words, spring's coming almost a half of a month earlier. And if spring snowmelt runs off the landscape about a half month earlier, and we're only able to capture a certain amount of water, that means there's less water later in the season when we really need it for things like um, agriculture, for sugar beets, for wheat, uh, for also recreation and for natural resource needs. So this leads me to talk about the impacts that those water resources have in terms of some of the things that we do here in the West. And here we're looking at projections from 2081 to 2100. We're looking at runoff on the left-hand side and soil moisture on the right-hand side. In terms of the changes in our global water cycle that are tied to temperature, these two components are pretty important. And you can see that there's a big bullseye, red bullseye, in the western United States. We will likely experience um, less runoff and earlier runoff in the western United States. We will also likely see an increase, or uh, sorry, a decrease in soil moisture over this time period as well. When we have a decrease in soil moisture, then our agricultural resources are stressed even more and we have to add more water to the landscape. 
So there may be likely more water demand in the future from an agricultural perspective because of these combinations of lower soil moisture. And we may also have less amount of water on the landscape. This leads us to think about what may likely happen in the future and comparing it to the past, which is really one of the things that I think is very interesting about being able to look at geologic evidence of vegetation change and lake level change and water availability through time, and then applying that to future water resources and thinking about what may happen in the future. We're looking at a few pieces of information on the left-hand column. We're looking at two historical droughts in the West. Okay. This top figure is the 1950s drought. Um, this bottom figure is the early 2000s drought. Um, some people would argue that that drought is even continuing, especially over here in parts of California and Oregon and Washington, because it's been a very long and persistent drought. If we model these conditions, we can reconstruct them pretty darn well. That's what these maps are showing, that reconstruction of those droughts. We're looking at the values of the PDSI stands for Palmer Drought Severity Index. This is an indication of um, the impact that changes in temperature and water resources have in terms of drought and soil conditions, especially in, from an agricultural perspective. The right-hand column happens to be future projections 2006 to 2030 and 2035 to 2060. And what's interesting about these projections is in terms of creating these projections, no significant changes were made in terms of precipitation, but temperature was increased. So temperature was increased 1.4 degrees C over this time period, and what we see in an environment with an increase of temperature like that is an increase in the severity of the drought and expansion of the areas that are impacted by those droughts. Again, if we see no significant change in precipitation, but we increase temperatures by 2.8 degrees C, which is reasonable because in some parts of Wyoming, we've already seen 2.5 degrees C changes in temperature. But in 2035 to 2060, those droughts get even more droughty. They get even more dry, and they get more extensive. So this gives us an indication that even, a, even slight increases in temperature can really increase things like evaporation and, de and decrease water supply in terms of stream flow. With that, I will leave you with a very important point that one of the things that we're doing is we are trying to capture what has happened in the past to try to provide information to water resource managers. We've been able to calculate pretty well with how many degrees increase in temperature what that means in terms of early onset of spring snowmelt. And those are tangible numbers that we can provide to water resource managers so that they can make plans and adjustments for future water planning in terms of water resources in the West. And I think that that's something that is very positive that comes out of this research. It may look bleak, but in reality, we actually have some very useful information that is tangible to be used in that water resource perspective. So with that, I'll take any questions if there are any. Thank you for coming and thank you for your time. question. Um, you know, it's along the lines of, um, if the planet's getting warmer, why is it snowing so much in Washington, D.C., right? Um, and, and, and in fact, your question is very well grounded in the fact that, yes, um, snowfall is increasing in Antarctica. And that's actually because the planet's getting warmer. So what happens here is a warm atmosphere holds more moisture than a cold atmosphere, okay? And those of us that live in Laramie, close to the front range of the Rocky Mountains, can really appreciate this in the springtime. We get what we refer to as, um, you know, front range snowfall or upslope flow or things like this. And that's where a heavy amount of moisture comes from the Gulf of Mexico and it's forced up the front range of the mountains and we get these really heavy wet snowfalls because a warm atmosphere holds more moisture. And a cold atmosphere has a tendency to be very, very dry. 
So if temperatures are increasing globally, including in Antarctica, it stands to reason that snowfall would increase in Antarctica as well. But the key here is thinking not only about the snowfall that's falling in Antarctica, but the rate, ooh, sorry, the rate of uh, melting that's occurring in terms of Antarctic ice. And that's also related to the warming part of your question. And as the planet is warming, Antarctic ice is melting faster than it's growing. So the mass balance, even though it's snowing more, that snow is not accumulating as fast as glacial ice, as it's certainly not accumulating as fast as the glacial ice that's already there that's melting. So it seems counterintuitive to say, well, yeah, as the planet warms up, some places are going to get more snow. But that's because a warm atmosphere holds more moisture. Does that help? So over here on this side and then in the back. Um, so just to bring it back to water, you talked about pop water policy in mm -hmm. the West. I think probably a lot of people have read Mark Reisner's book. Yes. About all, the, all the vagaries of that. Um, but my question is this. I don't think that Wyoming is part of all a lot of these Western packs that relate, for instance, to the, uh, to the Colorado River, et cetera. Do you see a potential political fallout in terms of the, the resources and their source uh, as, as this unavoidable future. Sure, and, and, and as it turns out, so the Colorado River Compact really deals with um, a small portion of western Wyoming related to the Wind River Range that has the headwaters to the Green River. So that portion of the state is, is committed to that compact. So it's between seven states in the west as well as between the United States and Mexico because the water from the Colorado inevitably used to make it down to the Gulf of California. So we're uh, required by those federal compacts to provide a certain amount of water to the lower basin states because in the western United States our water is divided into uh, or we go by the first in line rule. If you used it first, you get it first. Okay, And as you can imagine, parts of Wyoming, since we populated a little bit later and we have less people, um, we don't have as much of that water right as other states farther down like California or Arizona. So that's one component uh, to answer your question there will be likely, likely, you know, fighting about water resources. Um, it is projected in the next five to ten years that some of the lower basin states, especially California and Arizona, will likely make a call on the river. And what they do on a call on the river is that means that they're asking for the upper basin states to send more water downstream. And they're allowed to do that. But here's what's interesting is some states are dealing with this in a very unique way. I just read an article last night about uh, Las Vegas. And one of the things that Las Vegas is doing is Las Vegas is selling a portion of their water allocation that they get from Lake Mead to California, to Southern California. As long as Southern California wants to pay for it, they'll give them some of their water because it turns out Las Vegas has really done some amazing things in terms of water management and water conservation. When Las Vegas wants their water, they'll not sell it to California. And then there will be some big challenges. So you're absolutely correct. Another component to answering your question and thinking about this process is that the water in the Colorado River is presently over-allocated. It's allocated by acre feet rather than by percentage. So the Platte River Basin that I talked about in the southeastern portion of the state is, is, is split up by percentage of water amount, which is a safe bet that allows you to build in changes in water availability from drought. But the Colorado River Basin is based on water amount, cubic feet per second. And that water allocation is based on one of the wettest periods in thousands of years. Before we had a better sense of how really truly dry it is in the West. So that's going to be another challenge that we're going to have to face in the future is how we actually look at how we're allocating that water. And it will be messy because it's seven states and two countries. So stay tuned. So there's a question in the back. Uh, with all the research that's been done about uh, water, it looks like maybe what can we do about global warming? Wow, that's a big question. Um, in all honesty, um, I think one of the best things we can do 
is draw upon resources that we have in terms of social scientists. Because, because the story's kind of almost over. It's warm, and it's going to get warmer. The question is, is if we're going to do anything about it, and what we would potentially do something about. And that gets into much trickier waters, so to speak, okay? Because then we have to consider um, politics and values and various perspectives and what people, how people prioritize those things. And to understand that, we really need to think about prioritizing our interests and the information that we get from social scientists. And here I'm talking about political scientists, geographers, if I may, um, um, other social scientists, philosophers, and drawing from people in the humanities. I mean, this is, a, this is a problem for all of us that we need to think about, especially in terms of our water resources. Also, you know, working with those social scientists and also engineers. Um, so, so if we want to, you know, really approach this, I think it's important for us to open our minds and think about who we need to talk to and how and why we are going to approach this if we want to. So there's my plug for the social sciences. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, yes, in the front, please. Where is the impetus coming for this water management transformation? Is it coming from the federal government or the individual states? Well, I think it's, you know, where is the, where is the impetus coming from in terms of water management? And in the West, I think it's coming from a lot of different levels. For example, I have a great student who got his master's degree in water resources and geography, and he has his dream job. He is a hydrographer in the Bighorn Mountains. And he gets to work outside, he gets to deal with water resource issues, and he deals with people on the ground every day who want to get more water access to their fields. Then if we move up a level and we look at the um, Wyoming Water Development Commission, Okay, through the state engineer's office, they have funded some of our research because they're very interested in understanding how lake levels have changed in the past. They're looking at increasing the number of water holding capacities or essentially dams, small dams, in the state of Wyoming. That in turn costs money, so we need to look to the money that we have in the state of Wyoming and to the taxpayers of Wyoming. That then is a larger picture in terms of interstate water compacts and what we can hold in terms of reservoirs and where we can hold it in terms of basins. So it, it, it get, it's sort of, I think of it from a hierarchical perspective. Everywhere from the individual uh, rancher and farmer on the ground all the way up to federal law. And it's very, very tricky. So there was a question in the back and then in the middle. I'm sure in the national labs and the universities, there's hundreds of people trying to figure out how you can stop the rising global temperatures. Um, physicists, the things about sending carbon particles. Have you heard any good ideas along this line that actually, other than just, uh, raising our hands about the fact that it's getting warmer? What, what, what can mankind do to stop? So, um, you know, it, the bottom line is that what we have done is really quite literally a chemistry experiment. And in chemistry, there are actions and reactions. And our action has been to take uh, materials that are in deep reservoirs and then burn them, combust them, and liberate them into the atmosphere. We're committed to more warming over the next 100 to 200 years plus because carbon dioxide has a pretty long life in the atmosphere, upwards of about 150 years. So the carbon and carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere is there for a while. Um, some engineering approaches have been to, uh, the idea has been to put sulfate aerosols in the atmosphere, which block incoming solar radiation, and then reduce temperatures. But they reduce temperatures not as much as temperatures are increasing. And there's another pitfall, right, if every action has a reaction. Um, another pitfall to that is when you block incoming solar radiation, you reduce your productivity of agriculture, right? So there are challenges that are faced. And it also takes a fair amount of energy um, by way of sending particles into the atmosphere. And then we have then added some of that energy back to the atmosphere. Um, 
I don't have the answer, unfortunately. I think, like water resource management, it will require a lot of different perspectives, um, a lot of different options and engineering approaches at multiple different scales. So I'm sorry I can't provide you a better answer. Right here, please. Well, following the conversation flow here, and it seems like the best question this has is this third one. Um, in regard to Kirsten's question in the back about how we're going to fix climate change, mm -hmm. that seems to be the thread here. Um, it's pretty clear that the whole system is exacerbating itself. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty clear that the CO2 is here. And it's pretty clear that other things like methane, although I don't think we covered that, is, you know, it's much more powerful, but we tend to want to measure the CO2. Mm -hmm. So it's been said for a long time, we certainly know that carbon sequestration mm -hmm. is, a good, is a good option. And when the question is asked, it sounds like, what can each of us do? immediately come back to something about social science. Right. Everybody's in on this. No, mm. one, no one's getting out easy. That's pretty clear. So for the carbon sequestration, because we know we've cut down half the forests in the whole world, we know they hold carbon. Right. We know that it actually cools the earth, although we know it pulls up a lot of water. And we know we don't go around and water every tree. And we know we're in one since talking about Wyoming, because we're kind of at the top of the food chain. So with all this BLM land, with all this land in the west of mm -hmm. Mississippi, everything on the other side, right. does it, isn't it incumbent upon us to plant a heck of a lot more trees? Sure, and we need water for that too which is a big challenge. You know, you saw that map of the locations in Wyoming that get less than 16% or 16 inches of precipitation in a year, and that's 70% of the land mass in Wyoming. Um, and anywhere really east of the, um, east of the Rockies are, you know, really in those very dry conditions. So that's a big challenge. Um, in terms, of, you know, I've seen some studies in terms of, um, planting trees as a way of sequestering carbon, um, and we'd have to plant a lot of trees, and we'd have to water a lot of trees. And your question about carbon sequestration is really interesting as well. We need a certain um, sort of right conditions in terms of the right type of geology, um, and that requires a fair amount of energy to inject that CO2 into the ground as well. Um, and so there are actually folks at UW um, in the engineering department and in the geology department that are working on that very question as well. That it plays into the whole carbon offset. Yes. Attack. And of course they're not going to all grow. You know, I think you've identified exactly the point of why this is a global issue. We all live on the planet. We all drink and need fresh water. You know, if we're just going to look at those two things, you know, how do we approach this? And that's where I really am, you know, making this call to the social sciences and the humanities that, you know, we really need to be very creative in thinking about this. Um, I think we have time for maybe one question, if that's okay. We can talk about this more afterwards at the break as well. Please. My question is this, uh, is that who, where, uh, or is it being done? I'm sure it's done. Who studies the aquifers in the state of Wyoming? Mm -hmm. And uh, so when can I get my baseball cap? Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we'll have baseball caps ready the third week of November. I'd be happy to give you my business card and happy to send it to you wherever you want. It's, they're really good baseball hats. Um, in terms of water, and you're making a very good point that I have not even touched on in terms of groundwater. And, and it turns out that the University of Wyoming has received one of the largest grants in history um, related in the history of UW related to just this question, groundwater, and the connection of groundwater with deep surfaces and also the connection of groundwater with the atmosphere and the surface in terms of stream flow. Um, and so there are a variety of folks in geology and water resources and eco ecological service sciences and geography that are working on um, this very question because that's one thing that we actually don't know that much about 
is how that water moves from the atmosphere into reservoirs, whether we're talking about uh, immediate aquifers or even deeper reservoirs. Um, and, and so there's a lot of geology and hydrology that's involved in that. And there are some folks that have gotten some fantastic funding from National Science Foundation, and they are working on just those questions. Thank you. Thank you very much.